Hi, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us through a number of great sessions so far, and I'm excited to host you for another one. My name is James Green. I'm a partner in the VP for content at Actual Tech Media, and in a past life, I was an IT pro. Uh, I worked for a couple of different VARs, as well as with some customers, and I particularly liked working on the VAR side, and I was always curious about what it would be like to work on the vendor side, although I've never done that. I work with a lot of vendors today have a little bit of insight into what that's like. But um, for this panel, I wanted to bring together a couple of folks who are on the VAR and vendor side to speak with you about what it's like to be in that world. And if perhaps that's interesting to you, what you would need to know and do to move into that space. So I have with me today two guests. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Denny Armentrout. You see him in the middle here. Um, Denny is the general manager for a uh, VAR here in Des Moines, Iowa, where I'm at. And in fact, I used to work for Denny. And Denny hires the best consultants, except for, you know, that one time he hired me. That was a bit of a flub. But for the most part, Denny hires incredible consultants. And so his perspective on what makes a good one is going to be valuable today. Uh, and then Eric Wright is on the far side of your screen there. Eric Wright is like you and like me, works for worked for a customer and for many years now has worked for a vendor. And so his perspective here will be about what it's like to jump from being on the customer side to working for a vendor and, um, you know, building products and supporting customers. So it's awesome to have you both. Thank you for being here. Let's just jump right in. Um, Eric, I, I said that I had had some interest when I was, especially when I was working with customers about what it would be like to work for a VAR or for a vendor. In your mind, it is a different sort of role. What are the pros and cons of a role like that one versus being a, an end customer? It's a great question, James. And if you're passionate about technology and you're you know, like what we began as doing, right? Just curious, curious, continuous learner. When I was in the customer side, literally worked for two decades running data centers and you know, running small organizations, everything from desktop to servers to cloud. I really enjoyed being able to spread my wings. I was always going outside the lines of my team, looking to talk to the network people, to the storage people. But then what happens is you learn and you start to see well, what's going on in the industry, what's going on in other vendors. And, and then you realize you're actually too far outside the lines. And I never got a chance to really implement a lot of the things that I was excited to be able to explore. So when I moved to the vendor side and took that first role as a technology evangelist, which is what they used to call it before they were called developer advocates, it was a neat opportunity to be able to suddenly have this broad view where I'd already worked in the community and the open source side a lot, because then you could effectively live through the experience of this open community. Well, now I could literally affect all sorts of different types of environments, everything from a, a dairy producer in Wisconsin up to you know a, a healthcare company in California, banks in New York, small mom and pop style shops out in Vancouver, BC. It was really neat that I could now span the world, span every sector, every vertical, as they say, which I always dread that word, but it allowed me to take my passion and actually see it out in all these different environments. So it was a huge win. If you're keen on exploring beyond what you can do directly today, you can really, really impact people and you can touch a lot of technology. So it was a real big, big boon for me to be able to move there. The alternative of course is I had a greater responsibility. What I used to do as my side hustle was now my hustle. And as a result, I had to change those, the pace of normal because before it was like, I was squeezing it in in the evening hours. I was doing it at lunchtime. Well, now it's a full-time gig and you think, great, I'm really just going to have all day to do what I used to do in two hours. Well, no, you have seven times as much to do during that time. So the real, the pace of movement and the need to stay on top of it was greater. Uh, it's a joy. I, I would never trade it. You know, personally, I've, I've enjoyed the benefits on both being able to expand my, my passion, my growth and commercially it worked out much better. Definitely on the vendor side of the world, there's a, a financial opportunity, which is a, a nice little bonus. Yeah. I will say, uh, if you're hungry 
and you're looking to grow, either the vendor side or the VAR side are just so broad and so fast that you will uh, accelerate your depth of knowledge and, and breadth both. And I, I've always thought, I can't quite put my finger on this, but my very first uh, serious IT job was with a managed services provider and th that meant every day seeing, you know, whatever, 10, 15, 20 different environments. And I think that was, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but an incredible leg up because I got to see how it happens in 20 different environments instead of one. Most people have to go to a new job to see a different one. And I think that served me incredibly well. Um, Denny, so I mentioned that you hire awesome consultants. When you're looking for those folks, what are the top couple of things you're looking for that makes them a superstar? Yeah, well, I love Eric's word, passion. Uh, be passionate about technology. Um, we've done quite a few in, uh, engineer interviews over the years, and um, the one thing that we kind of home in on is what are you passionate about? Um, the uh, the, the candidates kind of rise above the fray when they get into um, kind of describing what they really enjoy doing. Um, the, the ones that stand out are good generalists, but then they're great at something. So if you can find somebody that has that base skill, um, but then they're passionate about wireless or passionate about security, um, you can work with that. You can find them work. Um, and, and, and that you can build a practice around, which we've done uh, quite a bit of. Um, take somebody that's, you know, a, kind of a generalist, but then passionate, um, you know, about some technology that, that certainly is fundamental to what we do. And then the final thing that um, kind of seals the deal would be they're okay being uncomfortable. You know, get comfortable about being uncomfortable because in consulting, uh, you're, you know, if it was easy, you wouldn't be called. And so that complex, you know, wow, this is a weird situation, we need help. Um, and so you gotta be okay uh, being thrown into the fire. Uh, you know, you can't uh, tap out easily. Um, and those are, um, you know, qualities that, you know, might not be always easy to put your finger on during an interview, but um, once you can identify that somebody's got that, it can go a long way. I have a couple of thoughts about that. So about the passion, I think places today uh, generally, I think are cognizant of work-life balance and try and be very respectful of that. But when you find the candidate who goes home in the evenings and is doing Visio diagrams of the uh, firewall or whatever, um, you don't want to ask them to do that, but you can tell like, ooh, they're into that. They're going to be really good. Uh, so that's one thing is, you know, if this is you and you're thinking about this, uh, what is that thing that you're still thinking about at eight, nine o'clock at night? That probably is a useful skill to uh, a reseller or an integrator somewhere. Um, and then the other thing is about getting comfortable being uncomfortable. What I learned is uh, it's okay if you also say, I don't know, as long as you've got the next step, which is who do you call now or where do you look? Um, yep. Just throwing up your hands and going, well, I don't know, that's not going to work. But nobody expects you to know all the answers. They just expect you to help solve their problem. So as long as you, you know, I would focus on building up the skill set, yes, but also focus on building up the Rolodex and knowing how you can get help if you get stuck. Uh, which means like networking internally, figure out who else on the team can help you, as well as building relationships with you know other vendors or whatever it might be. So on that subject, Eric, when you're let's talk about the vendor side specifically. Um, what does it take to be successful working inside an organization like that compared to maybe different things it takes when you're at a customer? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's like wrestling a bear. You wrestle it until the until the bear's tired, not until you're tired. You really have to go a little beyond yourself for a while, and you have to. Like Denny nailed it. Uncomfortability is is something you have to embrace because that ability to get through discomfort means that you can 
start to talk to sales folks, start to talk to operations teams, work with the development teams. There's all these really diverse personalities and, and styles of work in the organization. And in the end, you have to become customer obsessed. That's sort of an overused phrase these days, but the, we understand what it means. So you have to always think in the context of somebody's going to pay for this service. When you work on the customer side, quite often you, you lose sight of that. Now I never, I chose to never lose sight of that. I chose to go beyond my team and, and make other people passionate about doing that. And in fact, I saw people really rise up quickly in the organization. So moving to the vendor side was not being afraid to get on a customer call. Like it was uncomfortable, it was difficult, but it, I knew that I had to do that. Surrendering, right, the independence is actually an interesting thing. I was disco posse. I was a blogger. I had done all these things as, as an independent person. And when all of a sudden you're taking that brand, that name, that thing you built, and you effectively give it to your vendor in the trust that they're going to take your brand and carry it further because they're giving back to you that you can do this. It's a beautiful thing. But now I had to then say, okay, I'm going to get on a sales call. And I thought, goodness gracious, my whole life has been avoiding salespeople. And now I'm on a sales call, but you can do it with integrity. You can do it by empathizing with what the customer experience will be as a result. And they detect it, right? Just the same way that a dog detects fear, a customer detects that you're not a salesperson. They know this person cares about the outcome and they're a technologist. So you can really kind of nerd out and enjoy it. So I loved that ability of like just embracing discomfort and then quickly, it's like, uh, you ever see the movie Full Metal Jacket? They start at the beginning and they're all the guys getting their heads shaved. And then an hour into the movie, they're teaching the next class and they're leading boot camps. That's what you are. A year into working this life, you're suddenly watching somebody come in and, and they're green, they're brand new and you're saying, okay, Let's, let's shadow the sales teams. Let's sit with the ops folks. Let's go to the engineering kickoff. And you can kind of really bring people through that experience. It's uh, in the end, like the tech is exciting, but it's the human side of it. That's so much more about what I love. So, you know, I said that I was interested in making this move. The reasons were um, I, I was like hungry to grow more. And I gathered that in either a VAR or a vendor type of company, that's going to happen. Um, I gathered that it's probably the case that you have a uh, compensation advantage in one of those companies. I think there's certainly exceptions to that, but um, especially on the vendor side, in, sort of in the same way you can like make risky investments and they may pay off big or you may lose everything. You can go work for like early stage startups and have, you know, some sweet compensation packages that if the company does well, you do really well too. Um, so there are certainly advantages there. The bigger, more established ones where you're not taking such a big risk also tend to just pay a pretty good base. So like there is an advantage to doing this if you want it, but you have to know what, what you're moving into. So Eric, I'm going to stay with you. You've made this transition. What do you wish you had known when you decided you were going to take the leap from being an end customer to working for a vendor. Now it's been, what's it been? Probably six, seven, eight years. Eight years. Yeah. I just crossed the eight year mark. And then not only going from uh, working for, uh, I worked for Turbonomic and, and, and now we were just acquired by IBM. So as of a couple of days ago, not too long ago, I became an official IBM employee by acquisition, which is kind of wild. Yeah. It, if I could go back to myself, I would say, you know, do it again, but take your risk of, uh, you know, make the comfort of risk and push further. You know, I was, I hedged very much, you know, maybe it's because I'm Canadian and I'm a little bit, you know, shy <laughs> on some of that risk. But at the time, you know, I, I had to think about the bet and you mentioned it, right? You are betting on the success of it. You're not getting equity in a company. You're getting options to purchase equity in the event of something that happens, either an acquisition or going public. At, so it, nothing is a sure bet. I've been on the right side of, of a decent bet and it worked out well for my family, but I'm certainly not retired. Nobody is, right? So it, it just meant that 
I put work into it. So my CEO would, would tell me, he goes, he, he learned his lesson too. He says, I understand equity, right? Understands the thing that you're giving up because your base plus equity is the long-term package. If you look at, you read any book about Amazon, they're a fantastic organization, amazing people. And they know, like they actually talk about their salary caps because a lot of it is really based on the long-term view. So that's really what it is. In the end, understand your risk tolerance and think about the long-term value that you bring to that company and that it brings back to your family. So something to think about there is if you're going to especially work for a vendor, not so much with a VAR most of the time, but for a vendor specifically, the comp compensation package may be more complex and you'll want to be able to understand that and maybe reach out to some people who can help you grasp that. Um, so Denny, we got to wind up here. I want to ask you one last question, which is for anybody who's listening who finds this attractive, whether it's working in a company like yours to be a consultant or maybe working for one of the companies you partner with, like a, an HPE or a Cisco or a company like that, what is something that they could do to start moving towards that, whether that's a development thing or networking thing? One recommendation from each of you, and then we'll call it good. Network. Um, you know, we can't find people. Um, we're not willing to compromise and, and settle. Uh, culture is such an important ingredient. You know that firsthand. Um, we're after people that know people, right? We want a, a, a warm reference um, before we take a chance. Uh, it's kind of hard to unring a bell. You know, when you bring somebody on, you take a chance. So um, network is key. Build up that, uh, your brand, your personal brand. Be known for something. It could be hard work. It could be certs. It could be experience. Um, uh, that would be um, probably my, my biggest recommendation is uh, get known in your market um, and make some noise. Cool. Eric, what about you? What's something that people could do today to start moving towards one of those roles? Create. Become a creator. The only way you become a great writer is to become a decent writer. The only way you become a great video creator is to become a decent video creator. It's a, a, a labor of love and practice. And the way that you become an expert of brand, a, a, a recognizable source is by putting yourself out there. And it's tough. Dan talked about the discomfort. Uh, you know, but it's out there and choose a niche, right? I mean, Zamfir was the master of the pan flute, maybe because nobody else played the pan flute, but like we know him as that, right? And there are technical experts that become that person. And, you know, Denny's a great example of somebody who nurtures that. We as a community want to create opportunity, go to your peer network and just read, consume, and then create. So I'm going to double down on that um, because I think, Eric, you and I have both found a lot of success in deciding to just create. And what was the result of that? Well, I got better at my practice because, you know, to write an article about something, I had to understand it well enough to not sound dumb. So I got better at what I was doing. Because it was published, I got known, which goes to what Denny was saying. Um, and I, I just not that long ago, look at the first article I ever published. It was terrible. But to your point, you got to just start. And a, a bunch of people told me that, and I've now passed that advice on to 100 other people. I think that's great advice. Uh, start a little journal even. Don't, don't even publish it at first, but just pick a topic you wish you were better at and uh, write a little even fake article about it, and you'll be better for it. And then someday, put that out into the world. I think it'll work out for you. Well, thank you guys both uh, for offering your advice here to aspiring VAR or vendor IT pros. It's been fun chatting with you folks. I hope this was helpful. And if you want to talk more about what it might be like, um, we'd be happy to chat with you. You can um, send a message in the Q&A. We'll be there and uh, answer your questions there or find us on Twitter and we'll continue the conversation after the event's over. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.